And so begins our journey into Python. As we start to learn about Python, I want to talk about both what the language is and some of the philosophy and ideas behind it. So as a language, Python can be classified as a high-level language, meaning that you're not working at the lower levels where you have to manage pointers and do garbage collection and things like that. Um, You're not dealing with registers or these sorts of things. It's a high-level language. It is interpreted most of the time when we talk about Python. There are systems for compiling Python and, and doing things like that. It is mostly interpreted. Um, You will use it primarily as an interpreted language. It has a large set of standard libraries, which many other languages do too. And you can, of course, bring in other libraries as you would with just about any other language as well. The thing that makes Python, I think, the most unique is that it uses dynamic typing also called loose typing. It is not strict like Java was or like Haskell was. Um, It's way different in that regard, and we'll see several examples of that. But it is still object-oriented. It is fair to say that everything in Python is an object, um, with maybe a few rare exceptions, but really not many and possibly even less than in uh, Java, for example. Um, And we'll dig into some of how those objects are stored and represented because it's, it's pretty different in Python than in C++ or Java or possibly other object oriented languages you may have seen. So, Python has a particular philosophy behind it that's kind of been upheld through the years. Um, And so I thought it was worth noting at least a few of the key items from that philosophy. You you can look up more of this and maybe a little more explanation um, along the way. But a few of the things that philosophically make Python a little unique are uh, the claim that beautiful is better than ugly meaning if there can be a clear and concise and, you know, pleasing way to write a program or solve a problem, that's way better than an ugly, hacky version that, you know, just really it gets the job done but isn't very aesthetically pleasing or isn't very clean of a way to do it. In the same vein... Simple is better than complex. There should be simple ways to do things, and you should use simple ways to get things done. Readability counts, and this goes along again sort of with the other two, that being able to look at code and understand what it does and to learn from it and share it with others in a way that they're actually able to benefit from it as well, not just run it, but build on it. This builds a community and this builds the ability to go back to your old code and figure things out about it or improve upon it. Now here's one that's a little harder to interpret up front unless you know a little more about Python. In the face of ambiguity, refuse the temptation to guess. Well, In Python, there will be lots of ambiguity. It is a loosely typed language. You will not always know the type of a variable or of the object stored in a variable that's coming into your functions. Uh, You will not always know the state of the program and lots of other things like that. And so because there can be so much room for uncertainty, then there are lots of ways to check whether the thing that you want to do is possible or whether the thing that you have in your hands is what you expect it to be. And you should check. You should confirm that things are what you believe they should be rather than just guessing and going forward with it. There are similar philosophical points around errors in the Python philosophy that errors shouldn't pass silently. 
You shouldn't just allow some error to continue uh, passing through your program. And so both the Python language follows these philosophies and it's hoped that people using Python to write code will also fall into some range of these philosophies. And that's part of the aspect of this class that I've emphasized over and over again is that what we really want to do is we want to find the paradigm of a language or the philosophy, in, in, in other words, of a language and try to match it and try to work with the flow of that programming language and of that paradigm. And then one that has a little bit of history behind it is there should be one and preferably only one obvious way to do things. That doesn't mean that you're restricted to only one way of doing them, but that there should be one obvious way that just flows naturally for people. An example of this in Python is that most data structures that you'll use that have any sense of looking up stuff have the brackets as a possibility to use for lookups. And this is not always true in other languages, right? You switch between some data structures use the brackets and other data structures use like a get or a find or something like that. And so there just ought to be one obvious way to do it. There may be lots of other sort of hidden ways that people might prefer and choose, but there should be one obvious way to do it. And the history behind this is that Python was created in part at least as a scripting language to be able to write scripts and do sort of um, little functions and, um, and to be able to automate things within an operating system and stuff like that, like the bash scripting language or like Perl. And many of the other scripting languages have lots and lots of really obscure ways to do things. You have to use dollar signs and they mean one thing in one context and another thing in another context. And so the philosophy brought into Python was there really just ought to be one way to do it that's obvious maybe some other ways that people can try and use too, but one obvious way that sort of follows and flows and is intuitive. So here are some suggestions of some resources on Python. There are two books that I would recommend. One of them is one of our textbooks and that's Learning Python. Um, I suggest the fourth edition because it deals with Python 3, versions of Python 3, and that's what I'll be using as examples and for our assignments. Um, Though Python 2 resources will mostly get you by fine, um, there are a few differences that will often break your code. The most obvious of these is that prints are done differently between Python 3 and Python 2. And so be careful about that. Similarly, the Python cookbook is a really excellent resource. It's now gotten a little bit old, um, but it gives you more advanced uses of Python and really good sort of solid examples of, so you want to do this kind of thing. Here's some base code that will get you pointed in that direction. And you can take that and run with it from there. Um, So, That's worth checking out. The third edition of it is the one that starts to use Python 3. Um, And then there are a few online tutorials and references. The Python tutorial is pretty good. The Python language reference is similar to, um, or yeah, it talks about the syntax, the behavior, the model of it. So it's sort of higher level. And then what would be similar to like the Java APIs is the Python standard library docs that will show you the different functions and the classes that are provided with the standard Python installation. We'll be using Python 3.7 for grading and for many of my examples. So again, beware of examples from Python 2 or Python 1, any versions of those. Most Python 3 things will get you by just fine, just the same between them. The differences are relatively minor within those main versions, the 3, for example, 3.x. Okay, let's actually look at some Python. So the syntax of Python is in some ways similar to most other languages, except it's kind of boiled down. 
it reduces the number of extra characters in many cases that you have to use and it reduces uh, sort of how much it takes to say one thing. So you'll notice, for example, in the if else statement here that the if doesn't require any parentheses, it does have this colon afterwards and then the behavior of the if portion. Then it has the else and just a colon there and the behavior of the other portion. And the for loop has some condensing to it too. We don't have to say for int x blah 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 for two reasons. One is there's this nice built-in function of range that will give us all the numbers from 0 to 100. Um, that is, by the way, exclusive of the number that's here. So it's like saying for int x equals 0, x less than 100. Um, it's exclusive of the 100 there. Um, so that's one reason you don't have to do the normal whole for loop that you might see in Java or C++ or things like that is because we've got this nice range thing that will give us all those values. The other reason is I don't have to say that x is an int because I don't have to declare the types up front. So similar to Haskell where we didn't have to state the types of our variables except there's no rigid hall monitor of a, of a type inference system that's going to say, ooh, well, you used x as an integer here, and then you tried to use it as a float down below. You can't do that. It will let you do that. It will let you define x here with integer values and later store float values in there and later yet store string values in there. And that's where that ambiguity comes in. And you want to be sure that the thing you're using is what you expect it to be. The other panic moment that many programmers have when learning Python is that all of their friendly brackets are gone and they think that it will be impossible to tell where their different statements begin and end, like if statements or else's or things like that. So we use indentation in Python to define the language structure. That way, it's not an optional thing, like in C or C++ or Java, where eh, it's nice if you indent, but the brackets will tell everybody where everything starts and ends. Well, for me at least, my eyes can see that indentation pretty easily versus brackets that I might not notice being placed there. So the print statement here is indented, and it's within this if statement, and therefore it will never print this statement because if false will never fall through into its, its statement here. If true will always fall through to its statement, so this print statement belongs to that if statement and will always happen. However, as you can see down here, because I indented the if true, that means it lives inside of the if false. So I will never reach any of this code down below here because it's all contained within the if false. So we do have to be careful about that and your IDE may be a little more confused on where to indent things and where not to indent things and you have to be in charge of it a little more than with friendly brackets in C, C++, Java, etc. But otherwise, you've got pretty similar control, control structures. If statements, else's, else ifs, while loops, for loops, many of the same basic control, control structures that you're used to. Functions in Python do get called a lot like C or C++ or Java functions, where it's function name, parentheses, and then whatever arguments, or if the function belongs to some class or some object, then we give the calling thing dot function name, and then parentheses and the arguments. So these are pretty similar. One exception to this is if you're working in older versions of Python, 1.x, 2.x, any of the ones or twos, then print 
didn't have parentheses. This was changed in Python 3 to standardize and make it so that they do have to have parentheses. Every function follows this same convention because there should be one obvious way to do things. Um, and this was kind of a violation of that rule that later got corrected. Functions are declared similarly in terms of the pieces, um, but they don't require quite as many frills as uh, C, C++, or Java functions might require. So you require this keyword, def, that says we're defining a function, then the function name, and then the parentheses and the arguments for that function. You'll notice that they do not have a declared return type because they can return whatever they want to. They do not have declared parameter types because again, they could take whatever kind of thing they want to. You could even within the function check and see if argument one was a string or an integer or something like that and behave differently based on that. In fact, you can even return different types of results from the same function. So I could say, if X is a string, then I'm going to return its length. Otherwise, it, I'm sorry, if arg1 is a string, then I'm going to return its length. Else, if arg1 is an integer, I'm going to return a string with that many spaces. And so one path of my function returns an integer and the other path returns a string. This is not exactly great design most of the time, but it is possible. And we'll see eventually that this helps us to handle some things that we knew were kind of tough in, um, in Haskell, for example, because we can return a null-like type that's called none, capital N-O-N-E, for any function. And we don't need to worry about whether it's an object or a primitive, like in Java. We don't need to have some wrapper thing like the maybe type in Haskell. Um, there is just, we can return different types and none is its own type. So that solves the issues that come up around null sort of types in other languages. Being able to return different types from the same function. Well, now we just make a special type that's our nothing. And we can return that from any function, whether that function normally returns a string or an integer or a cat or whatever. The parameters can be given default values in a Python function definition. So here we've got a power function that's going to raise some number to some exponent. And we just say, eh, the default is two. So that if you give me just a number, I'll square it. So if I said pow three, it will give me nine because it will just square that three that I've given to it. The parameters can be set by name as well. Um, what I mean by that is that I can choose a particular parameter that I want to give a value to, and I can say verbose equals true when I'm calling to that function. So here you see I'm calling print data with some data that presumably already exists. We'll assume that that variable my data was defined somewhere. And I don't need to define what end character is. I'll just go with the default, but I do know that I want it to be verbose. And so I state explicitly, I would like to define verbose to be equal tr to true. This allows us to not override the default values for some of those parameters, but to specifically override the default values for particular ones that we care about. And so we can use the parameter name and say, I'm specifying that one. When we write Python programs, um, one thing that we might want to do is to use or to write modules. A module is a collection of functions, classes, and or variables that's like a namespace in C++ or a package in Java. It groups some stuff. Um, essentially, any file that you write can be used as a module. So here's an example where I'm importing my file. And this does require that there must be some myfile.py that exists somewhere in my Python path. So that might be my current directory, 
That might be some library directory that defines my Python libraries. Wherever Python already knows to look, there must be a myfile.py somewhere in one of those places. And then I can import it. And then once I've imported it like that, then I say my file dot some function name or my file dot some variable name, whatever I want to use from that file, I have to reference it in relation to that module name, that file name like this. You can bring in specific parts and then not have to use the module name in relation to them. So for example, if I wanted to use log a lot and I didn't want to have to type math.log all over the place, or if I only wanted to import log because I knew math was a really big library that takes a long time to import all of it and I want to reduce memory for my program and computation time, then I could just say, I only want to import log. And now I don't have to say math.log, I just say log. You have to be careful with this, of course, if there's something else that has the same name, um, then one will overwrite the other and make it not possible to get to the other. Similarly, I could rename something with a nickname and then avoid that problem. So here, for example, I say, well, from math, I'd like to import square root, but I want to name it SQT. It's shorter to type, or I'm worried that there might have been another square root that was defined that I might still want to use, whatever. You also can do a star to import everything from a particular module and skip having to do that little my file dot or math dot or whatever as well. So it's up to you which style of that you want to do, and it may be up to some limitations of your system or other functions that are written with similar names or stuff like that too. But essentially, you can bring in modules that are built-in ones, or you can use any file that you've written as a module, as long as it's in the right place and Python knows to look for it there. There are many different data structures that are provided with Python. I'll show you a few of the basic ones that are sort of most commonly used. List is probably the biggest and um, really well optimized and has lots of functionality that's sort of specifically designed for it. But you'll also find that many other data structures model themselves in terms of syntax and behavior around the way that lists are used in Python. And that goes back to, again, that philosophy of there being sort of one obvious way to do things. That list is a very commonly used one. And so if you, if you use another data structure that follows a linear kind of format like lists do, then that other data structure might follow a pretty similar interface and give you similar syntax and style for it. So it's important to learn how to use lists well, because as you're learning to use lists well, you're possibly learning how to use other similar data structures well in terms of syntax and available features. So you can declare a list using the elements that belong to that list if you know what they are up front. You can also create empty lists. Um, most data types in Python, you can just say their name and parentheses, possibly some arguments if you think it's going to need arguments there. Um, but you can do, you can create an int this way, you can create a list this way, a dictionary, etc. For lists, most often what you'll see for defining an empty list is just empty square brackets like this here. So L equals empty square brackets. That creates an empty list as well. And so in terms of common syntax, that's the one you'll most often see. I mentioned the constructor looking one because most data types, even data types that, well, no, all data types, even data types that you don't expect to have a constructor probably have a constructor like this one shown here. So when we access or we set stuff, it actually looks pretty similar to a C, C++ array, Java array, et cetera, in style. The declaring is a little simpler, I would argue, but if we wanted to access the element at index zero, well, square brackets will get us there. 
and that will print out one in the case of the list that's shown here that was one, two, four. Then if I want to change the thing at index two, you'll notice it's zero indexed, so zero, one, two. That's overwriting four, and that's putting three in its place. So if I print out the whole list, that will print one, two, three. You can't access or set outside of the current range, but you can add or append to it. So for instance, if I wanted to create an empty list and then add one to it, great. I can do plus equals or I can do L equals L plus. Either of those will work just fine. I can similarly do plus equals with more of a list. And then if I want to add an item without having to bracket it as a list, then I can just call append. And that will essentially do the same thing as what I've done up here to add an item. So I can grow them. They are mutable. They can be changed, which is something to watch out for. If you pass a list in as a parameter to a function, then after that function finishes, there can be side effects to your list. It might change in size. It might change what specific data is stored in it. Um, so you do have to be very careful in giving lists to functions and knowing whether that function has some side effects. There is a very straightforward syntax for iterating over lists. And you will find, again, like I said before, many data structures model themselves off of the way that lists do this as well. So if I say L equals one, two, three, I can then say for X in L, this is sort of the for each loop syntax in Python. So for each X value that's in my list L, print out that X, well, that will print one, two, and three. So I'm able to, the spacing and new lines and things are different, but I want to make sure, make clear that it prints out all of the three values from that list. So there's a very simple syntax for iterating. You notice this is very similar to the syntax for iterating over that range of values too. And so again, one clear way, rather than a for each loop that's special for lists versus a for loop where I have to declare int i equals blah, 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 there's just one syntax for it. And that's the, the style in Python. A tuple is a collection of multiple items grouped with parentheses and commas. It is fair, though sometimes a heated subject in Python to say that a tuple is like an immutable list. People who are more mathematically or theoretically inclined will argue with me on that point, and I will concede that point to them if necessary. But for our purposes, as we are using Python right now, you can think of a tuple as being mostly like an immutable list. Now that we've had some experience with functional programming, you might start to think of it in that functional way that it, is, it exists. It is some theoretical grouping that cannot be changed. And that's why it's immutable. The coordinates 2, 2 in an XY coordinate system, they exist. Those can't be removed or changed. 2, 2 just is. Now, the location at which my character finds himself at a particular point in a game, that can be changed. So that is mutable. But the coordinates he was at before, those are still the same as themselves. So people will argue this point, but for us, eh, a tuple is kind of an immutable list. So we define it with parentheses and then commas in between items. Um, so here, for example, we can index it much like a list. So I can say T0 with the square brackets and it prints one from my one, two, three tuple here. I can create new references for new tuples from the one I have, similar to what we talked about in functional settings. So here, for example, I did not change the tuple one, two, three. 
One, two, three still exists as a concept. It might get garbage collected at some point if I change the reference from it. But what I've done is I took that one, two, three, I created a new tuple with four tagged on, and then I stored that, and it happens to be stored in the, in the variable with the, the name T that previously stored one, two, three. So it's worth pointing out, I did not change that one, two, three. If somebody else points to that one, two, three, they will not be changed by this. I created a new tuple and I changed the reference. And so you've got to switch your brain back out of functional land where T would be stuck being one, two, three forever. I can change what T references, but I cannot change that tuple one, two, three that exists right there. This makes tuple a, a little safer as a type to pass into functions. So if you've got a function that's going to analyze your data somehow, it might be safer to pass in a tuple because you know that tuple is immutable and will come back to you being the same data that it was before. Whereas if you passed in a list and someone subtracted one from every element in that list, your list may be changed and it might, have been, it might differ from the original. So um, we cannot change the individual elements within a tuple. We cannot even change the tuple once it exists, but we can create new tuples and we can change the reference that a particular variable points to to be a different tuple than it was before. So this is a mental switch for us. The immu immutability of tuples can make them faster than lists for some operations. They are often more suited to if you are doing a functional style in your programs, because one of the beauties of Python is that you can actually write in a functional style or in a more iterative sequential style. Um, and that's kind of a choice that you can make and you can switch back and forth between the two as well. So part of your program might be written with tuples as a kind of functional style program. And part of your program might be written with lists as a more iterative sequential side effect-y style. It's also often smart to use tuples as the keys in dictionaries, and I'll show you a little bit why we want an immutable type in, uh, in using as keys for dictionaries, but we'll, we'll see some more examples. Remember that tuples can be good for that and lists can be bad, and we'll see a little more of why. Looping over a tuple is the same as a list, and we actually have systems for giving names for the elements in a tuple so that they can be kind of a lightweight class almost, uh, a struct type of thing, for example. So I can create a named tuple that is basically data without behavior attached to it. So again, similar to a struct in, in some other languages. So I say point is a new named tuple and that the, the name of that tuple type will be point um, and that it will have two variables their names will be X and Y. So this list that's the second parameter will be the names of the variables that belong to that tuple. This allows me to do things like define a point to be 10, 0, define a second point to be 3, 5, and then I can ask for the X. So it actually, and this is the cool thing about an interpreted language, I defined a type on the line there that I'm able to refer to its values, its instance variables, if you will, its, its, its parts as a variable name. This would never compile in Java because the Java compiler would want to be sure before your program ever executed that X was a thing that belonged to points. But to do that, it would need to execute this line that defines a named tuple. So we're already starting to see in Python this way that being an interpreted and more loosely typed language allows us the freedom to make our program what it is, to make the actual functionality of our program 
as we go. We could allow a user to define the name of a type and the names of its variables and then to access them or things like that as well. So much more on the fly ability to define variable names, to define types, and we're going to see this again and again as we go through Python concepts. So the dictionary type in Python is, it's a map, it's a, it's like a hash table or, or things like that that you're a little more familiar with perhaps. Um, and at least when I teach those things, I typically teach them explaining them that they're sort of like an array, except the index can be anything, right? It doesn't have to just be a number. And in Python, that's even more true in ways that are wacky and again, maybe not always the best design, but the index can be any hashable type. So as long as that type has a hash function, then we can use it to index as the key in a dictionary. So dictionaries will be key value pairs where keys are unique and values don't have to be unique. Um, we can define a new dictionary with, again, the constructor style or with the, um, the brackets, the regular brackets you would use for like an if else in um, Java or C++ or that sort of thing. Um, so like a list can be defined with square brackets, the uh, dictionaries can be defined with the other type of brackets, the, the little bumpy brackets. So we define a new dictionary. Then we say, okay, for the key zero, your value will be the string test. And if we print D zero, then it prints out test. I could also say for the key string cat, the value will be five. Now, this is usually not the best practice to mix and match like this. Um, but again, we're allowed to, and that will allow us to store what you might consider primitive types, um, you might consider complex types. Uh, it allows us to store the none type, which is our null like value. And so again, that loose typing does give us some freedom. Sometimes that freedom gets abused. And I would argue my example here is to quickly show you a concept. Don't do it that way. Don't use different types of keys typically uh, for the same dictionary. But this is just a shorthand to show you that it can take any type as a key, as long as it's a hashable type, and it can take any type as a value whatsoever. And this includes the none type that is similar to null for us. We can loop over dictionaries. Um, the only trick is that we'll have keys and values, right? So we would, instead of for x in dictionary or whatever, we will say for k comma v, um, and then we're able to loop over all of the key and value pairs. And for instance, here we can print them. We can give them default values so that I could look up an item from that dictionary before it was defined. For instance, if I was doing counts of words, someone had written a letter and I wanted to count how many times they used particular words. Well, you and I would agree that a good default value for that would be zero, right? Any word that I didn't see, guess what? The count is zero. You don't have to write any special functionality to detect that that key was not defined for the dictionary if you use the type default dict. So it's a dictionary where you give it what the type is going to be and it will use the default for that type. You also can specify uh, a function that sort of maps you uh, another value to go here too. And we may see some other examples of that later on. But the most common is to do something like to give it the integer constructor. That's what you're doing here is you're really feeding it the integer constructor. And the integer constructor will return an integer with zero if you call it by default. So if I say that my dictionary equals a new default dictionary and it's going to use the integer constructor to make its default values, then 
If I ask to print item at the key four, it prints zero. If I say D4 plus equals one, then that will store one at index four. I could have said D5 or D5000 or whatever here because it will generate the default value and then it will add one and store that as at that key. And so again, a good example of this is counting word frequencies uh, that I could feed it a word that I'm seeing from that letter the person wrote. And I could just say, add one to that. I don't have to check and say, oh, is that in the dictionary already? It doesn't matter. We can create a default for it. So here's a default dictionary that um, has a built-in default type using a lambda function, an anonymous function like the ones we saw in Haskell. This lambda function takes no input and returns 100. Well, look at that. If I ask to print D4 now in this new default dictionary, it will print 100. So if I wanted some starting count that I was counting down from, for example, how many more am I allowed to let into this classroom or whatever, then I could have some default value that's the standard classroom size and I decrease it by one every time a student gets added to that class or something like that. And so here's an example using the constructor of a type as my function to generate the default, but I can use any function to generate the default in a default dictionary. And you will presumably find cases uh, as we do our work where this style is useful to be able to just look a thing up. And if it wasn't already there, you get a default value for it. Now, I'm assuming that you have become so fond of functional programming that you're deeply missing it as you see these examples of this strange, loosely typed Python world where values can change and there are mutable things. And we're not going to get away from that. I'm sorry, we're, we're not going back to functional programming quite. But you can get many of the things you might have become comfortable with, such as map, fold, uh, applying a function to things, or filtering, uh, and a free pony all at the same time using list comprehensions. I say list comprehensions because I think of them mostly for lists, but we'll see as we go through here that you actually can do comprehensions for a ton of different types in Python. Um, you can build types that can use comprehensions. It's beautiful. So what they essentially do is they allow you to do a map or fold type of thing, stepping through stuff in a function, or I'm sorry, in a, in a, a data structure, um, one by one, like a map. So here's an example. We do, we define the list one, two, three, and then we say, I'd like to do X plus one for X in that list. So this creates a new list, similar to our functional style. It does not change the original list. It will create a new list that contains two, three, four. So this is just like a map. And that's sort of the most common use of list comprehensions that you'll see is to kind of mirror what map can do. And it's typically in most Python implementations, very well optimized. It will probably do better than using a loop to try to do the same thing. It avoids some of those problems that we saw in Java, like doing plus on a string, where we end up building a new string, a new string, a new string, a new string at each step. List comprehensions are written to give you that final result of a new list, but not have to box up a whole new list with one more item, a whole new list with another item, a whole new list with another item, etc. So they're both beautiful and pretty well optimized in Python for most of the built-in data structures, at least. You can do comprehensions on a tuple. The only trick is that your result is going to be a list, and so you're going to have to convert it back to a tuple at the end. So for example, here I do x minus 1 for each x in the tuple, 1, 2, 3, and I'm allowed to do that, and I'll get out the resulting list of 0, 1, 2, 
and I convert that to a tuple at the end. Here's a dictionary where I say I would like to map each number to the string that contains that character for that number. This is not the word representation. This is just the quotes that number or that digit or whatever. So here we take the list one, two, three, and we step through each of those and I map the number one to the string that is quotes one and so on. And you can do more complex things with this. Of course, I could make a string with that many spaces or stuff like that as well. Here, we can actually take two lists and we can zip them together and we can make keys and values for those. So what this does, zip creates a tuple that would be one comma quotes A, two comma quotes B, three comma quotes C. You can imagine parentheses around those as I'm saying them perhaps. So it would be parentheses 1A, parentheses 2B, parentheses 3C, etc. Those will come out and get pulled out as K comma V, key comma value here, and now I've created a dictionary. So this would give us a mapping where one was the key to give us A, two was the key to give us B, and so on. So these ones up above are all pretty similar to a map in a, um, in a Haskell or a sort of more functional mindset of things. Here's an example that's like a filter where we keep only some values. So here's what, here what we're doing is we're saying x for x in 1, 2, 3, 4 but we only want to keep that x if x mod 2 equals 0. So this would only have kept 2 and 4. This would result in the list that is 2 and 4. So the if restricts who stays or who actually gets this done to them, which in this case, this is just it being kept in the list. We could have done x plus 1 or we could have done any number of other things to them right here at this spot too. But what we've essentially done is we just filtered down. So the neat thing with list comprehensions is I can both filter and apply some function at the same time. So I could have done this again, like I said, with x plus 1, like a map, and the if over here, like a filter. So one line could get me both of those features of both mapping and filtering at the same time. And again, pretty well optimized for doing that kind of thing. Here's an example that we all didn't deal with the application sort of thing because it deals mostly with functions that would do IO or that kind of thing. So in many functional languages, there's some sort of application mapping that does, you know, the possibility to print out everything in a list or that kind of thing. So we can do the same thing here. We can apply a function to everybody in my original list, like printing them out. That's pretty easy. I can also kind of do folds. It's a little more awkward, I would argue, syntactically than the other types up here. Um, so if I start a sum out equal to zero, like my fold would be given a zero as its starting value, then I can say sum plus equals x for x in 1, 2, 3, and by the end of it, sum will have the total sum value of 1 plus 2 plus 3. So you can do fold-ish sort of things with it. That is probably the one that's the least natural in style to do of these functional types. It's worth noting that there are built-in functions for doing mapping and some other functional type stuff, um, but it's usually recommended. Again, one obvious way it's recommended that you use list comprehensions or any kind of comprehensions over tuples or dictionaries or whatever, rather than named functions like map or fold or filter or things like that. So now let's say that you want to write a Python program. Technically, if you just write statements 
into a Python or into a file and you tell Python to run that file, every line of that file will be executed as a statement. That means that I define a function and that function definition is a statement that's getting executed. Its result is that that function now exists. If I define a variable, like I say x equals 27, then that line is executed, meaning that the variable or the value 27 gets stored in that variable x. If I make a print statement just as a line in my Python file and I tell Python to execute that file, it will, it will print that print statement. It's possible that we might not want some parts of our, our Python programs to execute when they're imported as a module by other code, for example. However, if we just make statements, all of those statements will be executed when our code is imported as a module. So let's say we had some lines in our program that were writing to a file or deleting a file or something like that. We might not want that to happen when somebody imports our stuff. We might not want it to delete files on their file system or write files into their file system just because they imported our code as a library. So one of the ways to specify which code is sort of the programming code and which code is the stuff to be imported and executed when the module is imported is to use this main functionality. There's a built-in variable that has two underscores and then name and then two more underscores. That's a variable that we can check. And if our program has been executed as a main type of program, then that name variable will store the string underscore underscore main underscore underscore. Python has a tendency to use underscores for sort of secret or hidden stuff, things that you wouldn't deal with typically directly, but that helps to guide you somehow. So for, for this example, if name is equal to main, that means somebody wants to run our program. But if someone tries to import as a module, then name is not equal to main. So we make a little statement here that if name equals main, then I'll do whatever my main program stuff is. Otherwise, up above there or outside of that if statement are all of the things that should happen when you import my code as a module. So function definitions or value or variable definitions or class declarations or different things like that. Those can happen outside of that if name equals main. And then in the if name equals main, that's where you would do something like a usage statement to tell people what the arguments are they're allowed to pass to your program. That's where you might do like user IO to ask them what file they'd like to open or different things like that. That's where you would do any of the kind of main behavior to get your program running as a runnable program. Um, that you wouldn't want the, to necessarily happen if someone imported. This helps to do testing. For example, um, if I open Python, just type Python, I get an interactive prompt, and then I can say import prog, for instance, in the example I've shown here, and that will load it as a module, and that'll let me test the functions. And that's exactly what my test code will do with your code. So you're able to define stuff as a main, that won't slow down testing of the function, won't modify files or do other stuff like that that you might not want to happen just because I'm testing your code or someone else wants to build upon your code by importing it as a module. So in this example, the word main will only print when you run this as a program like Python prog.py rather than when you import prog and try to dig into some of the functions or some of the variables that are defined in that prog module. We also um, can define command line arguments. These are stored in a special variable called sys.argv. It's a list, and that does mean that you have to import the sys module 
if you want to use that kind of interaction of accepting command line arguments. If you don't do anything with them, they will get completely unused, much like many other programming languages that arguments might exist, but we just, we don't touch them. So you have to import sys. Then you can, for instance, check the length of that uh, argv uh, array. All right, I refreshed with a slight modification here. You have to check the length of that argv array. In this example, I want to use like a dash f and then the file name. And so we check if argv1 is equal to dash f, and here's the modification I had to make, argv0 will always be the name of the program that was run. So this was presumably program1.py or something like that. So the argv0 will always be the name of the program that was run. So we'll check things like argv1 to see if it was dash f, and then argv2 being the file name. So here I'm expecting the user to specify a file name, and so I've made sure that they used the correct uh, argument here to do the dash f, and I've made sure that they've provided the file name. We can do more complex things. We could allow them to do the dash f or other dashes to indicate that they wanted to do it over a network socket or whatever other kinds of things. So this is just a very simplified example. If you get to very complex arguments that you're needing to accept, there are other more advanced libraries for handling arguments like the get opt and the opt parse libraries. These can be very useful in more complex programs or programs that you're going to be sort of handing off to users to execute and those users might provide you the arguments in different orders. For instance, they might do dash F and the file name and then dash O and some other file name to specify where the output should go. And you might allow them to do the output name or the file name in whichever order. Well, get opt and opt parse will help a lot toward smoother handling of complex arguments like those. So here we've seen some of the basic facts about Python, some of the philosophy around Python, the syntax and how it sort of flows and is structured, and then using that syntax in some of the, uh, or to, to use some of the basic data structures in Python. And hopefully you've started to pick up some of the style and some of how that style attempts to stay consistent, that important philosophical idea of readability and of there being one obvious way to do things. And hopefully you can follow some of that as you write Python programs and try to work within this paradigm that's set up for you by the Python language.